Welcome to the November 9th edition of Lunch and Learn. It's a conversation of code and issues important to the HVACR industry. Code issues are explained by the State Chief Inspector Tony Woodard with input from municipal and other code authorities. This is a partnership between the Arkansas HVACR Association and code authorities with the goal of helping HVACR contractors provide quality installations and service in what we all know is an increasingly complicated industry. Our goal is to protect the health and safety of consumers, as well as ensure that customers get what they were promised and paid for. Today, our topic is crawl space fire protection and how it relates to the heating and air conditioning contractor. It may seem foreign to most of us, but it is an important topic, and Tony Woodard walks us through the little-known territory of crawl space fire protection compliance and doing it right the first time. We begin in the middle of the conversation between Tony and Tom. This is really squirrely to me that we're even talking about this. Do you want to sort of jump in there and weigh in on it for a minute? I do. And I want, I want to make the first point clear to all our mechanical contractors out there today. This is not code in your code references other than where the code book says you must meet the Arkansas Fire Prevention Code. What we're trying to do today is prevent headaches for you or your company by making sure that the structures you're about to install your heating and air equipment are, are prepared for you, ready for you to go. Don't get in a hurry and builder says you need to do it. You need to work with the builder and ensure that they're ready because there's fire codes that have to be met that are, like I said, out of your code, but it could fall back on you and get into the bottom dollar of your profit when you have to redo work. Okay, I guess we're starting off with trying to figure out which code brought this thing about. How does that apply? The International Fire Code adopted by Arkansas, the fire code, and they had, they had some firefighters in Alabama get hurt during firefighting within a three minute fire time when the by the time they entered the home, they engulfed the floor and the fire was in the crawl space, basement area. They fell through the structure down into that basement area and had to be retrieved while fighting the fire. Other firefighters had to rescue them out of there. And after the study, they found it was these structural eye joist panels that fell through and lost their weight capacity. And it was because of fire, uh, fuel fired appliances where the fire started in the crawl space area underneath these. So they came back and said, well, we're going to provide a fire protection code of how you do a sheathing apparatus to stop this, to allow a longer, longer burn time so folks can evacuate out of the building. So this applies to new construction, just what we're accustomed to seeing. Somebody builds a house on a crawl space, and a lot of times we'll put the furnace under there, maybe put the water heater under there. It, and that's who it applies to, is that right? Correct. Instantaneous water heaters, stand up vertical water heaters, your your hot boxes, your uh, hardy wood stove, uh, hot coals. Uh, well, that, that's coming, but uh, the fuel fired furnaces, uh, that's what the code is referencing now. Any fuel fired appliance. So there are some exceptions. As of right now, yes, we the the elect your electric air handlers, your heat pumps straight electric air, they are exempt. Electric water heaters are exempt as of right now. But with that said, with the new 2021 fire code, they are, the language is in there to change it to any appliance under there, regardless of electric or fuel fired. Wow. The, I, I laugh every time I, I, I read this because I'm thinking about, you know, how many times have we heard of a house catching on fire because of the furnace down in the crawl space? I'm normally thinking about carbon monoxide poisoning. So this is completely out of what I would normally think about. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in on that, Tom. I mean, if we go back 80s and 90s and early 2000s, you, most of your crawl spaces were truly built out of 2 by 10 or 2 by 12 nominal lumber. And as our industry evolved and we got better, quicker, stronger, you would think a structural panel is a stronger building apparatus uh, and it is to some point. It's just certain ones have a failure point. And that's what we found during, during these fires that the nominal lumber will char and it takes a long time to structurally weaken it. Uh, but these manufactured panels were failing at a rapid rate. Within three minutes, three minutes, 30 seconds was the time frame. So, so that's what caused this. So, 
So if you don't burn them, they're plenty strong. But if you burn them, they, they fail pretty quickly. <laughs> yes, sir. Or tornadoes or hurricanes. <laughs> there you go. The 221, as you just said, may require any appliance in the crawl space would have to have some sort of fire protection. Let's look at the kinds of materials that are used in crawl spaces. You okay, got that to mention. Yeah, that's a good that one there. When you when you roll up on the job site, if you go into there and you see the two by ten or two by twelve, you're ready to go. You're ready to start your duct runs, install your equipment, and go. There's nothing else needed for you to uh, go ahead and start your job. So when you see this, you can go ahead and start your installation underneath the home. And and I want to make it clear, we're not talking about running a package unit outside and running duct work under there. We're talking about the appliance itself located under the structure. Then you got an eye truss. We've seen those. These are the ones that, that the bottom two by two fails, and then that's its structural point, and then it bows down like that, and then it collapses. So that those are the ones that we're talking about. We'll need some type of protection when we get further into your slide program here. We have dresses. Right, they have to be protected as well. They don't meet the this one as well. All right. The hybrid truss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fire floor joists over crawl spaces must be fire protected. This yeah, is this a new code? No, sir. It's actually was adopted in our 2012 building code that we started implementing January 1 of 2014. Builders weren't really aware of it and wasn't doing it and I, the when we were Department of Health, we weren't adverse into it until we attended the ICC training and found out about the fires and it came to light and we started moving forward about 17, trying to educate the heating and air contractors to get with the builders to ensure we meet the fire code. So this has been around since 2012? Yes, sir. Now, let me get a minute to get on my stump. Okay. This is a perfect example of why we need continuing education because it has been around for eight years, we haven't known about it. Correct. So I'll 100%. get off my stump, we'll move to the next slide. <laughs> How to protect if you got eye joists. Okay, what does it say? Okay, now that picture you have there, that's a good picture. That That's showing, I'd say a typical half inch sheet rock uh, or you can use five eighths OSB sheeting. Now the sheet rock, is misleading for the fact that it's just showing you going in there. If you're going to do the sheetrock, you're going to, you're going to have to have a mechanical room. And what is deemed a mechanical room has a floor, concrete floor in it. And you would have two by two, your two by four walls coming up the side, anchored to the floor. Then you would sheetrock that and the ceiling above you. It's a lot less smaller area you have to protect, but then you could use the sheetrock. Now, if you just want to floor off the large area, Without any flooring, you can use the uh, 5 8 OSB. This again does not, this does not belong to the heating and air man to do this work. We're just trying to point out if you get on one of these jobs, ensure that it's ready for you before you start installing your equipment. Okay, the one he pulled up here, the aggregated area, this, this is like if you could picture an eight by 10 mechanical room in there, or if your crawl space is just that small that you go in there and it's just 80 square feet, there is a blocking system that is allowed. The builder can use a blocking system and then nothing else is required other than once you meet the blocking requirement, then it meets the fire code, which is gonna be two by 10 or two by 12 nominal lumber nailed all through there, sealing it up is what it's gonna be. One of the things that I wanna point out here, and that is to ask a question, is it the responsibility of the mechanical inspector to make these calls or is it the building inspector that makes it? It's going to be the building inspector, but what, where we are in the state of Arkansas, your city inspectors wear multiple hats. They are the building inspector, but they're again, without continuing education on building trades, there aren't any, these guys aren't educated in this and we all learn when we fail. And when we fail is when we learn. And they are also one in a very few cities uh, have a true building inspector, like, like Little Rock has an, a building inspector, an independent mechanical contractor inspector. So this would fall under the building inspector to ensure this was proper and ready to go before the, con the heating and air. Of course, I don't know exactly how their 
inspection process works. Most cities I deal with, the city inspectors, they wear the multiple hats. They're the plumbing inspector, they're the heating and air, the electrical, the footer, the framer. And they just come to me and tell me we weren't even aware of this until it was brought to us during core training two years ago. So let's get real practical. And okay. that is at the rough end, the mechanical rough end, the contractor is looking for an okay on the job so far so that he can submit a bill to the builder or homeowner and get paid for that much work that's been done. But if an inspector shows up, even though the mechanical looks good, but the fire uh, protection is not there, he's not gonna get his, fire, his uh, rough end inspection, is he, as a mechanical contractor? No, sir, we have this going on in Benton County right now where a company had to pull the equipment out, disconnect the, the uh, gas furnace and several feet of ductwork, uh, return and supply, move it out so that they can build a mechanical room, wall it off, then they'll have to go back in there and reinstall it and now to meet the fire code. Well, I guess the point I'd like to make here is having been a small contractor where cash flow is really important, this points out how important it is, especially to the small contractor that doesn't have a you know, big bank account to carry him through a long period of time. And he's looking for that rough in inspection and clearance to be able to get paid. He better know code. Correct. That's another one of my stumps, Tony. Well, hey, you have several, we all do. But let's go to this one as to the why, again, you mentioned it earlier. Let's mention it again. Part of this comes directly from the commentary. Right. And that, that's exactly what it was. It was uh, firefighters fell. It was not just the homeowner. It was the homeowners were out. The firefighters were fighting the fire and two firefighters fell in. And it was like a nine to 10 foot fall. One of them broke both legs. They had to get the fire guys to evacuate them while fighting the fire. And after they did the study, arson investigators were out there to see if it was arson. It wasn't. It was a water heater that actually caught on fire. And within the three minute time that once they arrived, the firefighters were walking through the main living area and that's when they were, they fell through. But the firefighters are very heavy. I mean, uh, like I pointed before, an average person, if they weigh 160 to 180, firefighters, those of them in the field that know, that's another 60, can be as much as 80 more pounds of gear on them. So they're, you know, 220, 230 pound person, which the floor should hold easy. Building codes, 300 pounds or larger per square inch. So that, but you weaken one side of it and it collapsed with them. So that's what we, that's what the fire protection is for. You know, and I, I appreciate you being able to cover that because uh, if I don't know the why besides something, you know, why are we having to do it? My tendency is to resist and to ignore. But now that I understand that people have been hurt and people and our friends and neighbors and our communities could be hurt, uh, then I, I, I may not like it, but I can go along with it and then actually follow through and do what I'm supposed to, even if I'm in the county where I'm not going to be inspected. Yeah, we need to, we need to follow suit. And uh, this would be, a, as you said, a prime example to help educate the builders, electricians, plumbers, heating and air all in one. We're all in the same trade. We all work in the same trade. We all need to try to be educated together, I believe. So what does this mean to the HVAC design and install? Uh, I, I, my strongest point I'm wanting to push out is slow down a little bit. Just uh, walk in, check the job out, ensure the job is ready before you start putting all your manpower and, and labor into a job that you might eat. Uh, callbacks are very expensive and uh, very few folks can survive many, many callbacks. Uh, it, it will eliminate a business in a hurry. You know, and this is, I, and I, to the builders that are listening in, please don't be offended by this, but I want to say to our contractors that you may be doing work for a builder that doesn't know this and thinks it's ridiculous. And, and I bet you that are, we got some folks listening in that feel that way. But if you're going to put in a system you need to make sure that you are giving due diligence and informing everybody as to what needs to be done, even though it's not really our trade, and maybe even have the contractor sign a release that says they are responsible for all fire protection in that crawl space, because it's not our job as a heat and air contractor. 
it's not. And I, I'd like to loop in what there are. As of when the code was written, there are new products out now, Tom. There are some of the manufactured structural panels that have a fire treatment on them. There are some of those new panels that are are rated for that type of no other protection is required. And I haven't dug into them the cost versus two by tens. There's uh, I'm not digging into anything. Lumber's just absolutely through the roof right now. But there are other products out there that don't require any type of extra sheeting protection that can be used during the construction phase and, and eliminate some of this. But it, at the bottom line, it's the bottom dollar. And even the builder, everyone's trying to make a profit. So we're trying to save profit for the builder and save profit for the heating and air contractor as well, build a safe building for the consumer. That's our end game here. Well, forewarned is forearmed. And like you say, you, you can't, <laughs> You can't know everything no. when you find something out then, and especially if you understand why, then you can follow suit and do what you're supposed to do. But I love what you said a while ago. We're all in this thing together. The builders, the heat and air guys, the electricians, the plumbers. And we all know that we all have to learn how to get along and kind of understand a little bit about everybody's trade because we're all working in the same space. Uh, wholeheartedly. I, I agree. Well, this is the last point and I've already covered it. Builder responsible for fire protection as may be required by code. That might be something you would want to put in your agreement when you sign a contract with a builder or a homeowner that you're as a heat and air contractor, and that's what this program is about, that you are not responsible for fire protection. These seminars that we're doing every month are on the second Monday of each month. And we, again, want to say how much we appreciate Tony taking his time to be the authority, because after all, he is the chief inspector for the mechanical program here in the state. So when he says it, you know, that's the way it's going to be reviewed all across the state. And we also want to thank uh, uh, Lindsay for Lindsay Moore, who is the section secretary. Listen, I just want to point out it will be Monday, December 14th, not the 11th. Is that right? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> if, if I can't hit the right button on a PowerPoint, how do you expect me to know dates? <laughs> <laughs> want to get everybody there Monday, not Friday, and we'll, we'll all meet again. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. I appreciate it. All right. All of you that have tuned in today, we appreciate you so much. If you've got any questions, you can uh, call in at 501-487-8655, or you can uh, email me at tomhunt at arhvacr.org or news at arhvacr.org. And Tony, if they want to call the Department of Labor and Licensing HVAC licensing program, do you have a phone number they could use? Yes, 501-580-9641. Again, we thank you for your time and we look forward to, to visiting with you again on when, Tony? The December 14th. <laughs> thank you. Okay. <laughs> I appreciate your time. All right, Tom. Thank okay, you. Bye now.